So good afternoon. First of all, welcome. Um, good evening, I should say. It's not afternoon. I'm up at my time. Um, good evening. Uh, thank you all for being with us uh, today. Um, the holiday season is upon us. Um, I know that this year for many of us, it's going to look different. I mean that we really can't be with our extended families and, you know, do certain things that we would usually do um, during the holiday season. But um, I feel like we're just blessed just to just to be here. So I'm, I'm just happy just to see um, each of you um, tonight. Our district staff is our usual staff that attends here. Um, for every CAC meeting, we have Dr. Rachel Heenan and other team members, and I can have them speak out if, if you want them to do that. But I know they're okay with just you know, raising their hands and just saying hello. Um, and we also have um, our wonderful superintendent, Dr. Jill Baker, I know who is jumping from meeting, meetings to meetings, uh, but she's here with us, um, you know, at least for the first portion. So I always want to recognize her. I don't see any board members tonight that may be on um, YouTube. Uh, so if I do see them, I'll make sure to recognize them um, as well during this time. So just very quickly, we wanted to just go over some, some updates uh, within our special education division. We have been conducting um, parent opportunities, just a time for our parents to learn um, just together with staff. And uh, that is continuing. Uh, we had an event on December 1st, which was around um, Canvas accessibility and organization features. And on January 7th, um, from 4.15 to 5.15, I know that CAC and also our, our, our friends with uh, Long Beach Forward and many others have sent out this information. But we're also doing a more deeper, um, I guess, presentation around understanding the distance learning plans. You're going to hear some of that tonight with Dr. Wendy Rosenquist, but just know that the deeper understanding, the true deep intentions of the dis distance learning plans will be emphasized and highlighted and talked about more deeply on January 7th. And I know that Dr. Rachel Heenan, who was here with us, has an update as well. Hey everybody, good to see you um, again, like Dr. Uh, Simon said, for those of you who were able to attend our Canvas accessibility training, um, I know that it was super helpful and I even learned a, a lot. So I just wanna thank Rochelle Martin and her team for leading that and the teachers who actually um, went ahead and volunteered their time to go ahead and present and talk about their own classroom. So I just wanna thank you, just a little shout out there. Um, I also wanted to just make sure that everybody knew the school of choice process is upon us. Um, and if whoever um, has control could give me a little screen share time, um, I just want to make sure that everybody understands or has the knowledge to go ahead and participate in this process. Um, and I'd like to just share um, a few steps for parents and community members to go through this. Uh, so thank you, uh, Chris, or whoever shared it. So what you see in front of you is the district website, okay? So for those of you who have children who are going from 8th to ninth grade, or even 5th to 6th grade, the school of choice process is upon us. So what I wanted to make sure that you knew um, is where to access the website and the information. Um, in the past, I know you're aware we had parent nights and we had um, presentations and booths at our Long Beach City College for parents to go to visit and to talk about the programs at each school, to learn about the pathways, to meet the administrators and some teachers. And unfortunately, this year, due to COVID, um, this process is completely online. But I do want to give um, a huge shout out to Kelly Hodge and her team for making this um, school of choice process amazing. So myself, I'm a parent of a student who's going to be transitioning from eighth to ninth. So I definitely um, and making sure that I know how to access the process and, and explore this website with my own child. So what I just want to make sure, um, what I want to make sure that you understand. Okay, I'll send what I can stand back. There we go. Okay. Um, what I 
that um, you when you go to the district website, you're going to go under parents and under parents. If you scroll all the way down, you will see the school choice link. You're going to go ahead and click the school choice link, which will take you to the home page for school choice. So the first um, school choice that is happening is our high school, so our eighth to ninth. So I'm going to just direct you to this. If you do have a child going fifth to sixth, you'll go ahead and click on this link. Um, but this information is, is forthcoming. What's pertinent right now is the eighth to ninth grade information. And if you look here, there is the timeline for the transition from 8th to 9th, and that includes October and November. Um, there was information about a frequently asked questions document. There's information on how to make sure you have a parent view account. Um, and then from now through January 5th is the option to explore our high school pathway websites. I definitely would advise you to click on these. But one of the things that was super helpful for me as a parent is to watch this video right here from Parent University. And Kelly Hodge takes you through literally step by step on what the process is and answers so many questions for parents um, in, that, in that video. So I would highly recommend that you watch this video prior to scrolling through the website. So again, um, for parents who do have additional questions, there's the helpline right here, and you can go ahead and call and leave a message and they will get back to you very, very quickly. But I want you to see the website. So what, how it's structured is that um, there is three sections. There's a section on how to prepare for this process. And again, the frequently asked questions are here to make sure that you have a parent view um, account. And for students who are not enrolled in the district, there's information here, but that would not apply to most of you. And then this is the most important section here is the explore section. So you're going to go ahead with your student um, or your family and go ahead and explore the pathways. And I'll click on that in a moment. There's frequently asked questions in here. There's minimum criteria for specialized programs, um, and, and that will talk about GPA requirements. And then um, for career interest surveys for parents um, who children maybe don't know what pathway they're interested in, there's a nice document to go through, and I'll, maybe I'll just show you that right here, um, that you can work with your child to find out what your interests are. And then basically that will lead you to um, a pathway of interest that might help your child when picking a pathway. And then of course, we have our special education programs document in here in English and Spanish. And this document talks about our services at all the high schools with special day classes, RSP, transportation. It talks about um, our 504 plans, which are for our general education students. But the chart over here is what I think a lot of parents want to know, is what schools have each program. And just so you know, as a reminder, that every comprehensive high school has, um, which are our big schools, have um, pretty much every special day class program. Um, but our smaller thematic schools do not because of the size of their school. So this, inf this document will help you um, as far as to know what school has which program. If your child is in um, an MS program, these are the schools that have MS programs and that, that's, those are the programs that you would be looking at. And then the last option is um, to apply. So once you have um, decided with your child on what program or what school, you'll go ahead and fill out this application, which isn't open until January 6th. And just so you know, the question comes up is, is it first come first serve? And definitely not. So we advise parents not to all bombard the, the website on the first day because that might force it to crash. And it's not, if I sign up first, my child gets in first. It is a complete you know, lottery system, but by um, school of residence. So if it's your school of residence, you do have preference to go there. So all this information is on that video that is right here. And then um, this link right here, Explore High School's um, School of Choice sites, will take you, 
Again, there's another video here with some um, dates to remember. And then there's just, I mean, there's so loads of information on here. So I would encourage you to go through when you have some time just to go ahead and check out uh, the School of Choice website. And let me look at this last page. Okay. There's sections on meeting the principles, what are pathways, things to consider. So this um, website is a one-stop shop. Um, I'm trying to find, I'm, I'm learning this as my, uh, myself too. So trying to find the pages of the school sites. Maybe someone, let's see. If anybody has um, a lot more, wait, hold on. Oh, I will find them. I will find them. But I don't want to take up um, time from Mr. Anderson and Dr. Rosenquist. I want to say thank you, uh, Dr. Heenan. And just for our parents, I know that it may seem somewhat daunting, <laughs> that it's a lot of information. Yeah. But just know that the district is really um, looking at ways to provide parents with information, um, pertinent information amid COVID. We know that you know, you can't go on the school sites, you know, education celebration is going to look different this year. And so we're trying to find ways just to inform you very early to so you can play around um, with the system as well, just to learn it. So when it comes time to um, actually choosing your school, um, you'll feel comfortable with the choice that you and your child um, will make. So thank you for that. Thank you, Dr. Hina. No problem. I'm still learning like everyone else. Thank you so much. So one thing that I wanted to mention for our first speaker is to please, there's going to be a link in the chat box. If you wouldn't mind, please clicking the link um, and fill, just fill it out to show that you attended. It's there right now. It says attendance. Um, you can do it now or later, um, but please do that at some point. Also, everybody should have received the agenda, so I'm not going to share that right now. Everybody who got the link to them also received the agenda. Um, which brings me to our first speaker, Dr. Wendy Rosenquist, and she's going to be speaking about distance learning plans, and we appreciate you being here so much. Take it away, please. Hi, good evening. My name is Wendy Rosenquist, and I'm a special ed administrator with the district and today I'm gonna to talk to you about distance learning plans. Um, you may be familiar with them and you may not be, um, but I'm gonna give you a general overview of what they are. So before I start, um, I would like to kind of go over the what, the why and the how of what I'm gonna talk about. So today we're gonna, we're gonna talk about, and you're gonna learn about what is a distance learning plan. And I talk about it as a DLP. Um, I know we have a lot of acronyms, but it's a distance learning plan. And to see what it looks like, we're gonna talk about and have you understand the importance of the DLP and how you as a parent can provide input. Um, and finally, I'm gonna show you what that looks like in your IEP document. And I'm gonna explain the different parts and give you some examples. So let's, let's start with um, an overview of what is a distance learning plan. So in June of this year, there was a Senate bill that was about education finance, but it required, in addition, it also required IEPs to have a distance learning plan moving forward. So it required IEP teams to discuss it for districts to put uh, the paperwork into the IEP so that we could look towards distance learning. So what's the definition of distance learning? We all have been living it for a while, but according to the Senate bill, it means instruction in which the pupil and instructor are in different locations. And so that would be your student or your child is at your home or at a family's home or a caregiver's home. And the instructor or the teacher would either be at their home or the school site. So they're in different locations. 
Um, and what the plan does, it addresses how special education instruction and services will be provided. So we know students with IEPs, when we're in person, we follow the IEP. However, when we're doing distance learning, what happens? How does that, what does that look like? And so what the Senate bill does is it really gives us a roadmap for teams to develop that based on each individual student's needs in an emergency condition. And we know that right now in this pandemic, it applies. However, in the future, this plan will be part of that IEP in case any other emergency condition comes up that, that we need to implement this plan because we're doing virtual learning. Um, this overview is really general. So I'm gonna give you some information at the end to direct you to those parent opportunities where we'll go deeper into the distance learning plan and answer those specific questions that you have about your child, giving examples and what that looks like. So I wanted to first show you what it looks like when it's printed out or what you'll see um, on an electronic copy. And this form, it has, it has a few different sections and I know it's hard to read um, online. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna break it down and I'm gonna go over each section so that you're familiar with the different sections and then what it's talking about. So what I've done is I've highlighted the, different, the three different main sections. So at the top, you'll see there's an orange arrow and an orange section. That is a statement that is always there that gives you information about what is a distance learning plan? When do we do it? What does it mean? Um, and we'll go over that um, in detail. The second middle section, the green section, are a series of questions. So there are five questions that lead teams to ask questions about the student, about distance learning, and to really fill in information, and that's the meat of the plan. And so that's where all of the information from the parent and the teacher and the team will get put together for the roadmap for the, the IEP team, family, and student. And then finally, the section at the bottom, the yellow arrow very at the very bottom, that gives you a statement about FAPE. And what FAPE is, it's a free and appropriate public education offer. And so what it talks about, and I'll, I'll talk about it in a minute, it talks about is the distance learning plan part of FAPE? Is it not? And what does that even mean? So let's, let's go right into it and talk about the first section, um, that statement. So the remote distance learning plan for instruction, you'll notice that there's a lot of text on there. If you're like me, um, what I like to do is I like to break things up to read it. And even by what we call in, in the education field of chunking, this is just the first paragraph. And so for me as an adult even, I kind of gloss over and think, what's important in here? How do I even know? And then I know my students with disabilities and my own child, you know, how are they gonna read this and really understand what's going on? So what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna employ a, a good teaching strategy and I'm going to do a little highlighting and a little um, accommodating so that you can see what some of our teachers do in order to help our, our students with disabilities digest information, but also so that you can also digest it better. So here in the slide, I've, I've taken that first paragraph and I've highlighted different sections. And what I've done is, so for in the orange section, green section and yellow section, they have different topics of what I wanna to, want to talk to you about. So if you just direct your eye to the orange section, if you look, there's, a, um, there's some bolded words. And so let's start with that, 10 school days. Okay, so we got we, some things about 10 school days. So if I read that to you, if instruction or services or both cannot be provided to the pupil either at the school or in person for more than 10 school days. Okay, so we know that this is gonna be about if school doesn't happen for 10 days in a row. If we look to the green section, we see the bolded words of emergency conditions. So due to emergency conditions caused by fire, flood, and then it gives you a whole list of emergency conditions that you can certainly read on your, on your own, but they really don't apply and don't, we don't need to know that to understand what this is saying. And then looking down to the yellow section, the IEP will be provided by means of distance learning methods to the greatest extent possible. So then if we go back through that whole thing and we look at the bolded sections, 10 school days, after 10 school days, emergency conditions are happening, 
we are going to implement distance learning methods. So what all that means is that you as a parent can be assured that the IEP and this distance learning plan will be implemented for your student at home. Okay. So then let's go to the next section. This is the next paragraph in that statement. And rather than highlighting everything, I just highlighted the first most important sentence. And this gives you simply that definition that the Senate bill gives you of distance learning where a pupil and an instructor are in different locations. It does give you the may include and then gives you examples of, of what that may look like. So it may be interaction, instruction, check-ins, what we call in our district synchronous learning where the student is in front of the computer um, interacting with the teacher or the asynchronous where the student is doing the work on their own and then checking in with the teacher. Um, it talks about computer technology and the use of print materials, whether it's a packet or assignments with teacher feedback. Moving on to the last section of that statement, um, I wanna direct your, your attention to the yellow highlighted section at the top in those bolded words. So what this statement, this section talks about is, well, what areas is the DLP working on? So it applies to special education, what the, the classroom looks like, related services, so speech, uh, AT, OT, physical therapy. Um, it, it looks at transition services and extended school year, which we know is summer school. In addition, it looks at supplementary aids and services. And I'm gonna go back through these, but this is what the statement says so that you know, okay, those are the five main topics that we're gonna, we're gonna talk about in this plan. Direct your eye down towards the green highlight it says parent will be notified of the school's intent to implement the distance learning. So that you're aware of what's happening, the district can't just all of a sudden do a distance learning plan with your child. They have to notify you in writing and that's usually in a, a letter, whether it's via email or via um, US mail, that we are going to implement this because of the emergency conditions. So that was the top section. So now if we think back to the center section, and this is really the most important part of the DLP for both student and parents and teams, are the guiding questions. So what, the, what the, the form does is it leads you down a path to ask you questions to help guide you um, to answer them effectively. Um, and we'll go into them a little bit more later, but I wanna give you the topics right now. And those are the same topics that that Senate bill tells you and that statement tells you. So everything repeats, but it's good because it reminds us of what we're, what we're really focused on, and that's student success um, and student progress and student learning. So what I've also done is the question is on top of each, at each number of each box, but then in each box, I've kind of put in the topic to direct your eye so you know what it is. So the first section, the first question says, how will DLP academic instruction be provided? So that talks about academic instruction. The second question, if the student qualifies for related services, how will the DLP related services provided? So that talks about related services. The third question is how will DLP transition services be provided? Now I wanna point out that these transition services do not mean transition from you know, one place to another or from you know elementary to middle school. These are transition services for students that are 15 years and older. So if you have a high school student and you have a student in this, this category, you have what's called an ITP, which we call an individualized transition plan. And so the, the transition is from high school to life, right? So we're looking at post high school transition. Um, so for a lot of you elementary, um, parents or even middle school parents, this may not apply for this plan. Uh, the fourth question is what DLP supplementary aids and services are needed to support academic instruction and related services, including in general ed classes. So basically what extras are needed in order for this student to access their online um, learning? And remember, we're talking about only online, virtual learning, whatever that looks like, um, in the time that we're looking at. Um, and then finally, the last question, if the student qualifies for ESY, how will the distance learning plan, academic instruction, 
and related services be provided? Will it look like what it looked like during the regular school year or will it be different? And how will that apply to my, my child? So those are the questions. And then finally, the last section of that document, it gives a statement about FAPE. And so what it, what it says is the distance learning plan does not constitute a change in the district offer of FAPE. We know that when st our students are in person, that IEP document gives, gives families and parents and students the plan of what are the services, what are the, what's the placement, what is the offer that the district is giving that the, the, the student is entitled to during in-person instruction, right? This is what the team has talked about. It's based on goals and progress and needs. Well, based on the distance learning plan may look a little different than, you know, if we're online and the student's in front of a computer, their needs are different than they are in person. So the team may decide we need more time, less time. We need to add something or take something away based on how my student learns. Um, and so whatever those changes are in that plan itself doesn't mean that we're changing our offer of FAPE. It just means that during distance learning, this is what the student needs. And when we get back to in-person learning, the, the FAPE offer that's on the IEP is what is, is gonna be implemented, right? So you can be assured that if for some reason, say during distance learning, you don't want speech because for whatever reasons, the speech services is too much, too much screen time. When we get back to in-person, you get those speech services back, right? So that doesn't change. Um, so that's the, the last statement on that form. So now that I've gone over that form, I wanted to, to bring you back to it because that's a lot of information. But now you can think about that top section is the, um, that information that we talked about the statement. The middle section are all those questions that you are gonna talk about at your IEP meeting. And then finally, that last statement about the offer of FAPE and what that looks like. But really the, the most important thing for me and I think for you as well is why do we create this? Why, do, why even do a, a distance learning plan? I know that you know, we are required to do it, but, but that's not why we're doing it. We're doing it because it's important to students, families, and teachers, but most important to students. We've all lived distance learning since March um, in some form or another, and it's hard. And we know that it's hard for all students, but specifically our students with disabilities. And so if we can create a plan specifically for each child that addresses their needs, that can only make our students um, learn better, access the curriculum, and, and, and enjoy the time more. And so why do we do it? We do it because we wanna see students succeed and we wanna do the best that we can with what we have. So finally, I we wanna look at how do we create it? So I've given you a what is it? Um, I tell, told you about the why, but how do you actually answer those questions and, and what does that mean? So let's, let's look at those questions and, and kind of ask a few additional questions that can help you as you're sitting in those IEP meetings, think about so that it's not just about, well, what does the kid need? You know, how, how do we even know where to start? So let's give a starting point. So at the top, you'll see that those different sections and it, it bears repeating because those are the, the kind of what I call the buckets. So we have academic instruction, we have related services, we have the transition services, supplementary aids, and we have summer school. And so for each of those sections, I have some things to think about for each section for the team to, to talk about and guide them. Um, so first of all, what does it look like virtually for academic instruction? What does my student's gen ed class look like or RSP services or the special day class? What does it look like? And, and how, is that gonna be need, how is that gonna be changed based on my student's needs? Um, how are we addressing the student's goals? Um, you know, we know that the goals are the most important thing of the IEP that tells us what we're working on um, in addition to a lot of other things. And so if we're learning, if our students are learning you know, via the computer, via online, are we able to address those goals and what does that look like? You know, a lot of goals like reading and math, you know, we can modify and, and figure out and actually 
work on, but there are just some goals that, that we may not be able to do virtually. Say, for example, you have a physical therapy goal that says, you know, we're going to help you access the playground equipment. Well, we don't, we don't have, we don't have access to playground equipment right now. So that might be how, you know, we might have to think, well, what is it they're doing on the playground equipment? Are they stepping up? Are they moving around? And, and how can we adjust that? Or, or, you know, can we not work on that right now? And let's work on something else that, you know, the families need in the home to get to be mobile and to move around. Um, we also want to ask, even for all of those sections, what does screen time look like? You know, does screen time look different for academic instruction? Does it look different for related services? You know, you as a parent have, have been in it. You've seen your student and you know what they can handle, what they can't handle. Um, and I know that hopefully you've been communicating with your teachers and your related service providers and you've come up with something that is working for you. Uh, something else to think about is where is the student having successes? So we're talking a lot about what they can't do and how we're gonna change things, but I'm sure there are places and areas where the student is, is thriving. Um, even if we have to look for those places, we want, we want to because we wanna note those because those may be building blocks for our, our barriers and our weaknesses. So if a student is really good with you know, technology or really good with you know, verbal communication, let's use those skills to enhance everything else. We wanna look at, um, well, what adaptations are needed? So if this is how we're gonna do school, what does my child need in order to better help them within the confines of what the district can do? And so again, it's a team decision, but the team really needs to collaborate together because everybody has different information about this student to make sure that the student is successful. And then finally, the thing to think about when you're, when you're talking about these uh, sections is what do accommodations and modifications look like? We know with an IEP, you have a section that talks about what does a student need to, to accommodate? And what we talk about is what do they need in order to access the curriculum? What do they need in order to be level with their gen ed peers so that they can show what they know and they can learn along the same paths? Um, accommodations are things like preferential seating, you know, seated near the board, seated near the teacher, seated in the back, um, extra time on, a, on an assignment, um, things like that. And so I'm encouraging you as parents during this section, this, you know, during this distance learning plan is to say, okay, here are the accommodations that my kiddo needs in person. What does that look like when he's or she is online? And so let's let's write that down and let's document that so that everybody is clear on, on what we're doing. So I've given you kind of an overview, but I'm gonna give you a few examples. And I know this is really what people want, um, parents and teachers, and I'm gonna give you a few, um, but I'm gonna give you a place to go to get more examples. So the first example is screen time. Um, it's, it's a big ticket item, you know, screen time. If the student's on from, you know, the bell to bell, it's a long time. Is my, my child able to do that? Do I want them to do that? Um, what does that look like? And so you may have different, you know, building in breaks. And so the team needs to talk about, you know, an elementary uh, TKK uh, student is going to look different than a high school student's screen time. And so talk about, well, what is, what is the requirements and, and what is my student gonna do um, to be able to meet those requirements or how can we adapt that? Um, some example, another example would be attention. Maybe, you know, there are some students that in person can't attend for more than five minutes, 10 minutes, two minutes, 20 minutes. So if we know that and then looking at a student on the computer, is their attention affected by the medium? So let's write that down, let's, let's talk about it and let's come to some agreement on, let's build that time for that student because you know, our expectations are not necessarily gonna be um, the same in the same way for all students. There may be technology concerns. So whether your student doesn't understand technology, physically isn't able to use the technology, um, you, know, don't, you don't have, uh, you know, technology, you don't have strong Wi-Fi, whatever that may be, 
we want to take that into account too, because that's what distance learning is going to use that platform. So let's talk about, you know, how that student, you know, do they need packets? Do they need both, you know, the ability to check in with the teacher and to do some print material? Um, there simply may be too much work, right? Um, you know, there's a, a lot expected. And so maybe the, you know, if, if there's decreased assignments on your accommodations, maybe that's something that, that the team looks at to say, well, if there are 20 math problems, but five problems can show that my student knows that material addition, subtraction, algebra, then let's have him do five quality um, problems and show us what he knows rather than struggling extra screen time, extra time to get that those 20 problems done. Um, and that may be different in uh, middle school and high school for different areas. So English may be different, math may be different. Um, it may, and it certainly is gonna look different for different students. And I'm not saying that we just say, oh, there's too much work, let's just give them half the work or a quarter of the work, but let's really be intentional about what does your child need? Because we still wanna teach your child and we still wanna make sure that we give the same rigor that the general ed students have, but we wanna make sure that they have the tools they need to, to meet those standards. I put breakout rooms on here because we have students who are, they're really good online, they're good connecting you know, with their classrooms. As soon as the teacher says, I'm gonna, I'm gonna put you out into smaller rooms and breakout rooms, they get lost. They're not able to, to get in there, they don't know what to do, and so maybe, what you know, an accommodation for this student is they have a buddy, a designated buddy that kind of goes with them to their breakout rooms to just remind them of things or or help them out. Or maybe that student doesn't go to breakout rooms. And so just some some detailed items that you as a parent or a caregiver, you know, when I'm sitting next to my child or I'm in the same room, I see the struggle. Um, and then finally, the last example that I wanted to, to highlight for related services was push in versus pull out. And so what I mean by that is sometimes on an IEP uh, when we're in person on campus, uh, you may, your student may be in class and they may get pulled out for a speech session or an occupational session. Um, and you may say, you know, that screen time is a lot. You know, that's, it's a lot of work for my student to be in class all day and then to be pulled out for, you know, 30 minutes for speech. The team may be, agree that, okay, the speech teacher is going to push into that class and be, be present during that, that virtual Zoom meeting to help that student with the goals in speech in that setting. Or it may be the opposite. It may be that, you know, in that setting, there's too much going on, and I need my child to be pulled out at a separate time to work specifically on those goals. So that's something that, you know, having all the team members at the table talk about you know, you guys can come to an agreement and say, okay, this is what the student needs in these different areas. So that was a lot of information. And I know I went fairly quickly. Um, I tried to break it down so that it was digestible. But if you, and I highly encourage you to go to this parent opportunity on January 7th, it's understanding the distance learning plan. And it's by our, our great support team um, in the OCIPD department, Rochelle Martin, Ashley Rhodes, and Courtney Zabrowski. They're teachers, they're, they're educators, they're administrators, they're folks that are gonna be able to really spend more quality one-on-one -on -one time with you and examples to, to talk about, okay, so we have those questions. What does that really look like? How does that apply to my student? Um, and so that's the perfect place that you can go to ask questions um, and to really get go deeper into what I discussed today. Um, I think I might have a couple minutes to answer a few general questions. Um, if you have specific questions for your, your student, um, I'm gonna encourage you to talk to your case manager. But the other thing I wanted to say was, I know that one of the, the top questions is, is, or the comments is, I've never heard of this distant learning plan. I don't have one. How do I get one? Why hasn't anybody told me about this? Well, part of the Senate bill says that it's required for all IEPs moving forward. We know that the next annual, the next reeval, at the next IEP, your team is required to talk about it. 
However, if this is something that's important to, to you and the teacher and the team now that you can't move forward without it, you as a parent always have the right to, to request an IEP. And so with that IEP, then the team would look at these different sections and talk about and develop this plan. But please know that even if you don't have this plan in place, these are the things that we've trained teachers to talk about, to, to look at, and to really focus on in general. So the plan for the IEP is specific to your child as well. So I'm gonna stop sharing um, and I'm gonna open it up to see um, uh, uh, Ms. Yates or if one of the, the CAC um, uh, folks would would moderate that with whether it's in the chat or um, whatnot, if there are any general questions that I can answer before I'm done. So you can either raise your hand or write something in the chat room. If you have questions, we have a couple minutes. And if they want to just unmute and ask the question, that that's totally appropriate as well. And I know that sometimes it's hard after you hear a lot of information, you don't even know what questions to ask. Um, so as you think about it, as you rewatch this, or as things come to you, please, you know, jot those down, go to that meeting uh, training on January 7th, um, and it'd be a great place to ask those questions, or simply, you know, ask your teacher or what we call the case manager, who is kind of the the conductor of your, your IEP and, and your students' education. Doesn't look like there are any questions, but I just want to give a shout out, give a thank you to Dr. Wendy Rosenquist for providing uh, this information around distance learning plans. I see a lot of head nod, nod, <laughs> nodding, a lot of claps waving um, and just know that you might be saying, well, what more can I receive or you know, what more information is gonna be available for me around distance learning plans? Um, still, there's always more. I know that with Dr. Rosenquist, she tried to give you the most pertinent pieces, but as she stated, um, Rochelle, Ashley and Courtney are really gonna go even more so in depth um, around those distance learning plans. Um, before we move forward, um, CAC board members, I just want to say hello to Dr. Juan Benitez, our board member, LBUSD, who was with us tonight. Thank you so much for being with us, sir. I'm happy to see you. Yes, thank you so much for being here. And thank you, Dr. Rosenquist. That was really helpful. So our next speaker is Dr. Iona Powell, and she is going to talk more in depth about SB 98, what we need to know. Um, she's coming to us from the Stramski Children's Development Center and we're really happy to have her here. So I'm going to turn it over to her now. Hello, everybody. Um, my speech is not gonna be as long as I thought because Dr. Rosenquist covered a lot of that. So I'm just gonna add some bits and pieces to that. And I'm gonna actually start by, um, and I apologize if you showed it before I entered the chat room, but um, for any parent who is um, curious, and I can share my screen, correct? Yes. Okay, so um, what was just talked about, um, can everybody see it? You can actually, have this piece of paper um, to kind of go with the collaboration piece that was already talked about um, to look at the consent and kind of what parents would like to discuss or what they're agreeing or disagreeing with or what the school may agree or disagree to in terms of the plan. So there are a lot of forms out there. Um, I will talk about the bills briefly. I mean, there's hundreds of pages that address everything and I'm not an attorney. I'm not an educational attorney. I'm a psychologist. I just really wanted to present the information because I get so many questions myself. So by presenting, I'm also learning some new information myself. But anyways, this form is available and anybody who would like um, this or anything else that I will be showing, um, please contact me and I'll be more than happy to share. So this is just one 
form. Um, and, and I will show my presentation and we'll go from there. So give me one second. Okay. So there are actually two bills. Can everybody see that okay? Yep. So there are actually two bills that have impacted special education, um, the Senate Bill 98, which has already been brought up, and also 117, which is more about the financial piece of it. And um, I'm not going to go into details, like I said, but both those bills affect special education and um, affected special education and schools and the way things were being done or what the parents expected in general in terms of um, implementation, IEPs, all that between March and July. So I'm going to talk a little bit about how the bill affected everybody prior to July and then how the bill should be impacting everybody in a positive way um, since July. But that's a lot of kids who are in special education who suddenly received less or none, depending on the level of um, instruction, modifications, alterations, whatever you want to call it. I'm not going to be a stickler for definitions right now. But basically, 12.5% of kids in public school have been going through a rough time. I'm not talking about the teachers. I'm not talking about the parents. I'm talking about the kids who um, are having a rough time. I am talking about the kids who may not be able to navigate uh, a breakout room or may not be able to visually um, tolerate, you know, a, a screen with all the kids on the screen for whatever reason. So I'm talking more about the kids with ha who have a little more of a severe uh, disability or have a harder time um, by themselves receiving the education. And this has nothing to do with the efforts that the schools or teachers are making. It's just the reality that some kids are struggling a little bit more than others. So obviously it was already discussed, schools are still required to follow federal laws um, and state laws. Um, from March, when the bill was, in state, was stated, from March to July, um, there were some waivers, relaxation of timelines, and I think that's what was felt in terms of the parents not receiving or feeling like they were not receiving the support. So it's not that the schools or teachers or uh, educators or school psychologists were not providing the services. Like everything else, we were all getting, getting used to everything and trying to figure out what needs to be done, what's a priority, how do we do it? So the, the laws, the, the bills and the laws in general, the federal laws require children with disabilities to have equal access to services and resources, just like students without disabilities. Um, I, and I know it was already mentioned, work packets, access to eBooks or audiobooks, online telephone or distance learning. So that's all great. However, that means we need all the teachers and educators who are providing those services in classroom physically to be available, willing, uh, not sick, to provide those services online. And that sometimes it's easier said than done. So as long as schools make an effort, and when I say schools, I'm not just referring to one particular school. I'm not referring just with, to Long Beach, just in general. Um, I think the effort is there. And obviously with every month, we're all learning more and more about how we can implement what needs to be implemented. But Sometimes it's literally just realizing whether a family will do better with written packages like visual learners or audiobooks. And if that was not part of the initial IEP or the 504 plan, that can definitely be added in for the time being. So equal access definitely still needs accommodations, modifications, whatever the case may be. Whatever was in the IEP should continue within reason, obviously. Um, materials should be available uh, in whatever format is needed for a child to learn or to access the curriculum. Um, I know sometimes it's hard. Some families don't have more than one Chromebook and they have multiple children in the home. If they don't have 
that device, it's going to be very hard for kids to access their education. So I know there are a lot of efforts. I know there's a lot of fundraising going on to provide parents in general with free internet service, and that's been there from the beginning. It's also a matter of parents asking for the help. So sometimes, you know, it's a two, it's a two-sided communication. It's not just someone not providing the services. It's someone also not accepting or not knowing where to go for the help. Uh, assistive technology, I think that looks very different um, than it would be when the child was in the classroom, but obviously technology is a lot better now. I think we're all been forced to <laughs> learn more about technology and how to access it. So um, assigning reduced assignments, I know we already um, discussed that, and I don't mean uh, kids who have an IEP or special education children need to not have homework. It's just that a couple of changes should be made to make sure that the instruction, even if it is for an hour, it is something that they're actually taking in and they're learning. Um, modifying the curriculum, and I'm talking about all these things just kind of added there, but obviously this needs to be a communication between the school and the parents. Um, speech, occupational um, therapies, I think, can be helpful, but a lot of kids are not doing really well with this virtually. A lot of kids are having a hard time, especially the younger ones, sitting for more than five, 10 minutes in front of the screen. I um, I know a lot of parents and a lot of friends and a lot of uh, personal stories where you're running around with a Chromebook <laughs> to try to keep the kid in front of the screen, right? So the service is there, the opportunity is there, is just not easily accessible because some kids have a hard time focusing on the screen unless it's Minecraft or something that they're really interested in, right? Uh, so those two bills were meant to support everybody, I think. The problem is, you know, everything sounds really good on paper and everything is meant to help parents and educators alike, but it's a little bit confusing as to how to do that efficiently, right? And I think in the beginning, like March, April, May, I think everybody was trying to do their best. Now I think everybody has a better handle on the how, but obviously we can all get better um, and make sure that children are receiving their education. Um, there was a lot of discussion in terms of, um, and I have so much material that I, that I went through, but there's so much discussion in terms of definitions of what a waiver is, how much time does the school have before responding to parents, what does that mean, and um, are the schools still required to do an assessment or triannual, that sort of thing, right? So that's what I'm saying. All these, until July, were okay. The schools were not, for lack of a better word, forced to do a lot of this because everybody was still working and trying to figure out the best way. But as of July 1st, um, there are no more waivers in general, um, and schools are supposed to respond to parent requests just like they did before. So again, I know everybody's overwhelmed and I know it's not the easiest thing to do, but um, what I wanted to do is just um, illustrate that Parents can still request the meetings. They can uh, request um, assessments. And the schools need to respond in a timely manner like before with whatever the answer is. Now, I know it's really hard, especially with assessments, because I do a lot of those, and it's really hard to do them in person, right? We have to be safe. We have to take all the measures. Um, a lot of parents are, a lot of teachers are parents themselves, right? So some of them can't afford to be at school as much as they were before. And we just need to be aware and be uh, respectful for everybody struggling with something at this point. Um, so kind of to go back what, what uh, was already discussed, you know, it's, it's a collaboration, it's communication. Uh, we need to figure out how that virtual learning is experienced, how it's delivered, um, what does it mean to provide um, occupational therapy or physical therapy, because most of the time it's not looking the same way that it did before. Um, if someone has a one-on-one -on -one aid, obviously that doesn't translate in the home, so we need to put a pause on that. But what does that mean? Does that mean that the one-on-one -on -one aid can have uh, extra 
conversations with the parent and say, this is what I was doing in the classroom. This is what you can do. Do you think you can handle it? So again, you have aides, you have trained, certified individuals in the schools who are doing their jobs and they want to continue to provide those services and do their jobs is just physically impossible for a lot of them. I do know some people who sign waivers and they are willing to go into the homes. There are very few of those people and still provide some of those services. And that, from what I heard, is mostly from ABA therapists who are working in the classrooms and they're willing to go into the home and provide some of those services. Um, with respect to sitting with the child in front of the screen and using the ABA strategies to uh, help with, let's get, you know, checked in, let's do attendance, let's follow what we were doing in the classroom, which is really important. But for the post, most part, parents are doing this now. It's not the one-on-one -on -one aid. It's not the TAs in the classroom. So I'm not going to go into details about the transition services because it was already talked about. I'll be more than happy to answer questions at the end. But for the sake of time, I'm just going to move through. Um, but what I did want to mention is in terms of the interaction between teachers or other staff members and uh, students, I think there's a little bit of confusion and I'm not talking from the perspective of an, of an educator on this. I'm talking more from what I'm observing and, and the stressors that are adding to learning right now and, and that are adding to family stressors. So um, whatever the platform is, Zoom, Google Classroom, WebEx, all of that, or telephone, um, there needs to be a daily interaction. And for those um, who have not seen it, I'm going to show you. There's one other thing. There is a track sheet, sheet. So you are able to kind of look at the IEP and then write up. So this is an IEP or 504 plan. It's not the official document, right? This is just something to track. Um, and you need to figure out if your child during the time that they're in front of the screen are receiving the minutes or the hours that they're supposed to receive per day, per week in terms of education. And I'm not talking about when the teacher's talking, I'm talking about um, the interaction. So the actual exchange between um, teachers and uh, students. And again, it can be very difficult if, a child is not motivated, right? If a child is not motivated to learn or they're having a hard time paying attention, it doesn't really matter. You know, the parent's just going to run around, right? Um, but if the live interaction is not possible, and live interaction obviously means through Zoom too, um, educational institutions like the schools can uh, develop an alternative plan. And that can look very different from school to school. So I'm not gonna go into the details and that's not something that I come up with. Um, it's just basically an alternative method of providing um, access to the curriculum. Um, as long as the children are making progress. And again, defining what progress is will depend on the communication between parents and school. A distance learning really is everybody working together to develop a plan, whether it's Jimmy can uh, take a break and then come back and um, he can sit on a bouncy ball or he can do whatever the case may be, you know, to, to be in front of the screen and actually interact. Um, but also being considerate to all the teachers who are providing the services or who are in front of the screen trying to provide the education when kids are not in front of the screen. And I'm gonna talk about that a little bit more. Um, I'm not trying to add any conflict here because I know we have educators, administrators, and parents in the room. But if a school cannot provide the type of services that a child needs based on the IEP, there are a contracts and there are um, ways parents can have a child attend a different program for a limited time uh, with the district obviously um, facilitating this and I don't know about the pay. I know that schools can and should allow that when they cannot provide the services. So it's not just because a parent wants to change programs or put a child in a different program. It is only if the school 
uh, cannot provide the services or interventions that are stated in the IEP plan um, within reason. Um, but if the schools are open and communicating with the parents of what to expect, you know, how long it will take before we can go back to doing this intervention, um, using the tracker and just being a little uh, forthcoming. Sorry, I did not look at the chat. I will read that later. I'm sorry, it's in Spanish, so I need to take a little time. I don't know if that was for me. I will get back to the chat in a second. Um, so again, FAPE, it was discussed. Law requires, um, you know, for schools to follow, obviously, uh, the path of least resistance, you know, and uh, free and, uh, and uh, accessible education. Um, but explanation also of why certain things can happen. So if the IEP has one-on-one -on -one aid in the classroom, obviously, and that cannot occur virtually, the school needs to clarify that even if it's something that's understood or it's very obvious, right? So certain reasons need to be put in writing and explain to parents why um, something cannot happen. Um, descriptions of each evaluation procedure, assessment record, whatever was used to arrive at that conclusion. So that needs to be included in a written document so that parents and teachers and the IEP team, let's say five, six months, I don't know when this will be over, um, can go back and say, okay, this was the plan during this COVID period. Uh, now we're out of this, hopefully, right? And this is what I wanted to go back to based on everything I'm seeing and the progress I saw or didn't see happen with this particular plan, right? And it just needs to be a conversation and written down. It doesn't have to be anything major or, or um, conflictual at all. It could be a very nice conversation so that we can figure out what needs to happen in the future. And these very long bills basically are what I said. The impact from March to July um, was, I think, a little more on parents. Um, but assessments meetings, IEPs, addendum meetings um, should have and are happening since July. I know assessments are hard to do, and I know um, Harbor Regional Center and other regional centers are having a hard time as well. There is some testing that's happening online virtually, but not all testing can be done virtually um, in terms of standardization and validity and all that. So basically COVID, these bills, what, what, what does it mean? I think the pro is parents are more aware, stressed, worried, absolutely, but more aware of what a disability really means and what the teachers, if you're in the room, you, were feeling dealing with 20, 30 kids, 15 kids, depending on your program, right, in the classroom. So I think the pro is parents really understanding what happens academically when you knew the diagnosis or you know, you know, emotionally what's going on with your child, but academically you weren't there 24 seven or, you know, like five hours a day. So pros and cons to that, I think the pro is also the appreciation for the services that were being uh, in place and, and were being done um, and how the impact of COVID is limiting that. I mean, obviously there's more frustration, there's a lot going on within the home, uh, because of that. But on the other hand, I think it's good because we can appreciate what was there and what we can have again <laughs> once the vaccine works, right? So another pro I think is parents learning, adapting and becoming teachers, teacher aides, occupational speech and physical therapists or extensions of. Obviously that has a major impact on the relationships at home. And a lot of kids are having a hard time feeling close to a parent or close like before or not resenting a parent when they're seeing mom and dad as the teacher most of the time now. So I think it's it's got a negative impact on kids. And I don't know, I see a, a lot of doctors in, in the chat tonight, so I'm sure somebody will talk about this next, but um, a lot more kids are feeling the stressors and the pressure of what is going on without really understanding it. There are a lot more kids with uh, depression, anxiety, and suicidal ideation. 
uh, much more than ever before. So it's definitely impacting not just kids and parents, it's impacting everybody. So we need to be aware of that and figure out what would work. So these are some proposed um, methods or actions that I think would be really good to continue. Some are already happening. Uh, communication with clear guidelines, you know, like I said, transparency, being able to uh, communicate and say this is what's going to happen. This is not um, feasible right now, but maybe in a month or three, this could happen. Let's come up with a plan and, and see what we can do. Um, disclosure, you know, coming up with, with what can happen. Um, webinars and trainings, I know that was already mentioned. I think those are amazing, and there are a lot of websites that are offering those for free. Um, webinars and trainings for teachers, not just in terms of virtual delivery of information, but dealing with stressors and dealing with um, teaching a parent, right, how to deliver certain services or what to look for or how to communicate or how to do core math, right? If a parent's not really doing that all the time and now they're supposed to do it every day, you know, if we have some sort of training for that, I think um, it will go a long way. Peer-to-peer -peer mentoring, and that I mean teacher-to-teacher -teacher or teacher-to-educator, and also peer-to-peer -peer tutoring I think would be very helpful in the programs in the schools where this is possible, where a higher grade student can have a peer buddy um, who's in a younger uh, classroom to provide not only the academic support but the social connection that a lot of kids are missing. Accepting uh, outside evaluations, this is obviously my uh, plug-in. I've worked with a couple of schools where, for example, they can do certain measures, uh, but the school psychologists are not able or they don't have the, the resources to do a WISC or something like that. So if I can do that and provide the school with those results and we can collaborate to figure out what the best plan is for the family, I think that would help everybody kind of get out of this COVID funk because um, in the end, we just want to help the kids, right? Uh, and then collaboration to move forward and implement those services. Um, I think mental health support is very necessary and I believe the next speaker will be addressing that. But the mental health support needs to be there for students, for parents and teachers and staff as well. Um, just because some of us do this on a daily basis, it doesn't mean that it doesn't affect all of us. So I think the more support uh, we have out there, virtual or not, uh, the better we are able to cope with this and come on the other side feeling strong. Um, virtual learning is difficult for everybody. And um, the other thing that I wanted to mention now, and it's the last thing, is um, being on Zoom, being uh, attentive to something like a screen, not when playing video games, but when you're learning is naturally more tiring. A lot of kids who have visual processing difficulties, um, auditory processing difficulties, ADHD, um, you name it, are having doubly the hard time than they would normally because it takes so much more energy to deal with paying attention to visual information. Or if you have kids who have sensitivities to sound and the mic volume is not the right uh, volume, you know, setting, that could add a lot. So, you know, blue light, all of that, and I'm not gonna go into details, but I think we need to be mindful of everything that's happening, just like we would if the children were in an actual classroom. So um, the other thing that I wanted to bring up, and maybe this could be just a discussion at the end if we have time uh, after every speaker said their um, pieces, I think we need to consider the, um, these are the resources that I used and I can send this to anybody who is interested. I think we need to consider the webcam. Um, so I know not every school is requiring for children to be visible when they're in the classroom. You know, some schools, some teachers take attendance at the beginning of the class and some students um, can leave or turn off their cameras, right? So I personally don't feel one way or another about that. But I will give you an example. I sat in an IEP a couple of weeks ago and the question was all around this girl who experiences a lot of anxiety. She's not comfortable with the technology. She's not okay with being on Zoom. She shows up for the first five minutes in the classroom, then she turns off her video. 
and nobody knows if she's participating or not, if she's taking a nap, if she's in the kitchen eating, right? And the the problem was she has comprehension issues, right? So then the school and the teacher had a very valid conversation of, is it really comprehension or is it because she's not really partaking in the conversation and she's not engaging with the classroom, right? So if the IEP goal is for, I don't know, Jenny will engage with the classroom and ask one question per day and the teacher will provide her with either support or an answer, right? And if that doesn't happen, is it Jenny's fault or the teacher's fault, right? So we also need to be aware of some of those variables that um, are adding to the kids falling through the cracks, right? Or kids not making progress because we need to take everything into consideration. And of course, I'm not saying it's easy, but sometimes it's hard because you have one child in one room for some families, right? You have another child in another room and mom is working from home remotely, right? So the supervision is there physically, but not really in terms of telling Jenny, hey, Jenny, go back and talk to the teacher or back, turn your camera back on, right? So maybe someone else can address this and we can discuss this at the end if there's time. But the whole no video, video, I know legally you can't force kids to turn on their, their cameras. And I know sometimes you don't want people to see your background or your, your home. There are all these reasons, but in terms of learning and having access to the curriculum, reasonable and best sometimes takes a lot more collaboration and making the children understand that they will be doing a lot better and they can be more confident if they participated a little more or made use of the counseling services that are offered through school, right? So I'm gonna stop with that. If there are questions, I will be available. If not, I'll wait until the end. Well, Dr. Powell, this is Aaron Simon. I know we have to get to uh, Mike Anderson as far as his presentation, but I just wanna address something as far as you know, the cameras. So we know that many students, uh, number one, I mean, they're not just turning off cameras just because of, you know, mental health issues um, or things of that nature. They're turning their cameras off just because they're embarrassed, embarrassed about their environments um, in regards to distance learning. So in regards to the work that we do, we work with, you know, our homeless and foster youth, and honestly, their learning environments are not conducive to learning. Um, they're, um, logging on at parks or at homeless shelters. And so it's something that we're very sympathetic towards and also empathetic. So I can tell you that our teachers, our staff are reaching out to parents if that's the case and then working out, I guess some type of compromise with families in regards to that. So still, if a student's gonna turn off the camera, you wanna see maybe some, um, some things written in the chat, some asynchronous work conducted, but it's something that exactly. our, our teachers mm -hmm. and our uh, parents are working um, with very closely. I mean, there are just so many factors just in regards to distance learning. We know that it's not ideal, <laughs> um, especially Nothing for our <laughs> students with disabilities. But um, unfortunately, it's, it's where we are as not just a state, but as a nation. Um, and in Long Beach, we're trying to be very creative and innovative in how we work with our families and students around, you know, that distance learning, specifically with our students with disabilities. So thank you um, so much uh, for, your, for your presentation. And I just want our families to know that our staff here, the Office of School Support Services is doing everything possible to work with families. I know that many of you all have reached out to staff directly um, we have reached out to you directly. Um, we're attempting to do more just to inform and educate our parents, um, especially amid this typical time, amid this global pandemic. Um, and to say it's, it's not easy. We don't have a playbook. We don't have a playbook from our federal government. We don't have a playbook from our state government. Um, and a lot of these laws that you see are very gray. Uh, and still very confusing and not just for, for us, but even for, you know, advocates I know who are on this call, parents who are on this call, just people in general. So it's something that we're trying to work collaborative, collaboratively around in order to help our, our students move forward and thrive. So again, thank you. Thank you so much. And I'm going to turn it back over to our CAC board. Okay, so we're 
right now we're not going to have time for questions for Dr. Patel. We have to move on to Michael Anderson, but certainly pass those along to us and we'll pass them along to you. Um, maybe we'll have time at the end. We'll see. But now we have pleased to have Dr. Um, Michael Anderson. He's going to be talking about the mental health impact of the pandemic. So, Mr. Anderson, please take it away. Okay, let me see if I can uh, get this going here. Uh, oops. Let me see. Okay. Can you guys see that? Nope. Okay. Let me see. Share screen. Hmm. Let me see. Ah, this worked before. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry about I'll let this. You do something. So, Mike, can I give you a pointer? Sure. <laughs> so, find the presentation. You could unshare your screen, find the presentation you want, click on it, and then go out of it and then come back in to share screen. Okay. Good one, Dr. Murray. <laughs> okay. Go out of it and then come back in to share screen. Well, find mm -hmm. the presentation that you want. Do you see the presentation that you want to use? Yeah. Okay, is that it? Because we just keep seeing your name. <laughs> All right. Not if you want to forward that presentation to me, I can see if I can share and uh, present it for you or someone on the team. Hmm. No, I see it, but it won't. Uh... Let me see. Uh... Sorry, everyone. It's always Sorry. going to happen with Zoom. Give us one second. Mr. Anderson, are you hitting the green share screen button? Yeah. Mr. Anderson, is it the same presentation you sent me this week? Yes. Okay. Why don't you just kind of go ahead and get things rolling and let me see if I can find that presentation. Um, or if you want, you can uh, resend it to me via email while you're doing your thing. Let's see. Was the finding positivity? Mm -hmm. Okay. Let me see if I can share my screen. Give me one second. Should I help you out here, buddy? All right. Is this it, Mike? Yeah. Okay. Let me go ahead and do. I'll do that, and just let me know when you want me to move to the next slide. Just say next slide or. Okay. All right. All right. So, <laughs> finding positivity in distance learning. For so, what I want, what I wanted to do is I wanted to kind of go over some of the challenges um, first, uh, then explain those challenges, and then at the end, the last few slides, um, kind of go over some benefits and some solutions uh, for some of those challenges. So can you move forward? All right. So feed the positive, starve the negative. Um, it's something I like to start off all my presentations with. 
Um, try to find the positive and encourage the positive and then starve the negative. Uh, when you see those challenges, don't pay quite as much attention to them. Try your best to get back to the positive. Okay, next slide. So for feed the positive, search for the positive in every day because there's, there's challenges every day. I mean, just waking up, going through the day, uh, deciding where to go, uh, search for the positive in the everyday and then acknowledge the small things, the small positives. Okay, try to pay attention to those and then reward those false things during the day. Just logging on is a good thing. Um, just, just completing an assignment is a good thing. Uh, next slide. <clears throat> so starving the negative, ignore the small problems. We know there are going to be problems. We'll just let it go. We know there are going to be problems. We know there's going to be challenges and issues. Let those mishaps happen. And just know that there will be challenges. Just wake up during the day. Just wake up and just face your day knowing that there will be some challenges. Okay, next slide. Monitor your students' mental health. There's going to be loneliness, there's going to be isolation and a lack of physical connection. Okay, especially with our students. Um, students on the spectrum, students uh, with IEPs, there might be a, a little more, they might be a little bit more sensitive to the loneliness, to the, uh, to the isolation and the lack of physical connection. Just observe, okay, just be aware. Just be aware of your kids and how they're feeling and how this whole situation is affecting them. The next slide. And think of the role of school. School is a place of refuge. Okay, no matter how many problems or how many challenges your student might be having, they're, they're there every day. They were there every day. It's a source for food and it's a common meeting place. They know when they come to school, they know who's gonna be in their classroom. They know all of these things. So we have to kind of replace that, okay? You kind of replace that at home. Next slide. <clears throat> now there's gonna be increased stress for everyone. I feel it, my wife feels it, my kids feel it. They will feel a loss of control and they will feel a loss of structure. Okay, you've got to examine how the virus is affecting their lives. How are they going about their regular day? They can't see their friends as much. Okay, they can't, they, the, the, the structure that they get from waking up and going to the same place every day and seeing the same faces every day, the, the, the loss of that it can affect the child. Okay, especially a child with an IEP. And again, examine how, the, how the virus is, is, is affecting their lives, okay? Next slide. Now, with distance learning, there could be difficulty in focusing because there's no face-to-face -face interaction with their, with their teachers. There are, dis, there are distractions in the home. There, there's household chores. Oh, my son's home. Now he can clean out the garage. Now he can... Um, clean up the kitchen, okay? We've got to provide a quiet and calm workspace. If it's just a table in the dining room, okay? We've got to just be aware that there will be difficulty focusing and that if we can, during the day, during the, the learning time, we can remove distractions in the home and you know, schedule those household chores afterward, okay? Schedule those household chores afterward, okay? And again, provide a calm and quiet work, workspace. Next slide. Building a positive environment in the home, okay? They're home with you now more than ever. So three topics that we need to really work on. Listening, managing your own anger, and setting limits. And I'm going, to, I'm going to talk about each one of those uh, particularly. Next slide. So first, we're going to talk about listening and a self-evaluation. 
Why is it important to listen to your children? First off, to get a sense of how they are feeling during this time. What, 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 what challenges are they facing themselves? And observ observation is a form of listening. So watch them, pay attention to them. Okay, what are they talking about? What are they doing? What, what's occupying their mind during this time? Next slide. Why is it sometimes hard to listen to your children? A lot of times it's subject matter. They're talking about things that we may deem unimportant. They're talking about, like my son is, uh, uh, he used to be an athletic kid, now he's a video game kid. And sometimes that's all he wants to talk about. And uh, that's, that's kind of difficult. So that's what, that's one in the Anderson household. That's what's making it hard to listen to my children. Next slide. What is the best way to respond to your children after you've listened to them talk about problems or concerns they're having? What we need to do is look for positive ways to address their concerns. Okay, if they're lonely, if they're missing their friends, set up a Zoom call, set up a phone call. Okay, set up, set up a socially distanced uh, meeting somewhere and don't give advice. As soon as kids hear advice, they turn you off. Okay, so don't give advice. Next slide. On a scale of one to 10, it's a little bit of self-evaluation. Self you can give yourself a score now and then give yourself a score after we're done talking. So on a scale of one to 10, how effective are you at listening to your children? Now, really listening. Uh, now, the next few slides, we'll talk about exactly what empathic listening is. Next slide. What is empathic listening? And I'll give you five steps to empathic listening. So next slide, what is empathic listening? And it's an active process to discern what a person is saying. And when I am empathic listening, I've got to remove all distractions. Turn off the TV, put down the dishes, and just listen to what my kid is saying. And if they're nonverbal, I'm going to be observing them. Okay? Observing them. And I should know what my child's language is if, if he is nonverbal. Okay? So remove all distractions, pay attention only to the child who is talking. Next slide. Now, five steps to empathic listening. First off, be non-judgmental, regardless of what they're talking to you about. Don't judge until they're done, okay? If they're telling you about a video game, they're telling you about a conflict that they're having with someone or their brother or their sister. Don't judge, don't make up your mind about what they've done until they're done talking. And then next, give undivided attention. That kind of kind of harkens back to the previous slide, remove all distractions, okay? Turn off the TV, put down the dishes, take the headphones out of your ears and just listen. And then when you are listening, listen carefully. Focus on feelings, not just the facts. Okay, listen, listen to what they're truly saying, not what they're just, what's coming out of their mouth, but listen to the emotions, okay? Next, allow silence for reflection, okay? If there's a pregnant pause, let the child uh, break the silence, okay? And then restate and paraphrase so you know exactly what they're talking about. They may just go off on a tangent, but kind of restate and paraphrase to get them back on subject and listen, truly listen to them, okay? Next slide. Managing your own anger, next slide. Now, there are ineffective ways we express our anger. If they're not logging on, if they're not doing the work that they're supposed to, they're not checking in, um, some of the ineffective ways we express our anger, we pretend that nothing is wrong and just walk away. Okay, fine. Okay. We lose our temper. We fly off the handle. We throw things. We yell. 
we say things that we later regret. And you can say, I take that back. I didn't mean it, but there's no taking it back. Once it's out, it's out. Okay. And it's going to take a long time to make up for what we just said. Okay. We withdraw and sulk. We know we've done something wrong. We may have said something wrong, but instead of apologizing and working through the problem, we will, with, we will withdraw and we will sulk and we will let it, we will push it down and it will hurt. And then the next time something happens, boom, I explode again. Okay. Next, we express our anger indirectly by taunting others. Well, that's why you got an F. That's why you did this. That's why you did that. That's why you not productive, not productive at all. Okay. Next slide. Now, let's talk about the emotion of anger. Pretending we're not angry when we are is not healthy. Okay. Therefore, we must separate the emotion of anger from the behavior that is so often displayed by angry people. Remember that it's possible to be angry without being aggressive. I've been on playgrounds for 30 years. And I can see how parents express their anger through the way that the children express their anger on the basketball court, on the handball court, on the tetherball court. Okay. It's a teaching moment to be angry and not be aggressive. You're showing your children that you can be angry. It is okay to be angry without being aggressive. I can't tell you how many times I've said that on a playground or in a quad, okay? Just be aware of the emotion of anger. And we're all on edge right now. We are all on edge, okay? Just going to the grocery store is a, is a, is a production. So just be aware of the emotion of anger and how it affects the kids that we, that uh, how it affects your children, how it affects the household. Okay. Next slide, please. Now, the art of setting limits. Setting limits is, is, the art of setting limits. Now, we've got to talk about, we're going to talk about a few things. We're going to talk about some logical consequences. We're going to talk about what setting limits mean. It's not just punishment. Setting limits is, is it's, it's an offering of a choice. We're going to talk about using logic versus emotion. And we're going to talk about enforcing consequences when it's inconvenient. Okay, next slide. All right, a little self-evaluation. The main purpose of discipline is A, to punish my child for doing wrong, B, to teach my child good decision-making, C, to vent my anger and frustration with my child, or D, to exact revenge on my child for making me mad. The correct answer is B. When setting limits, when we are setting limits with a child, we're offering a choice. And I'm going to explain that a little bit more. Okay, next slide. All right, what is the difference between setting a limit and issuing an ultimatum? When we set a limit, we are offering a choice. Okay, an ultimatum is a threat with no choice given. So a quick example of, a, of setting a limit is if you clean your room within 30 minutes and your friends can come over, an ultimatum is clean this room and you're not going out or you're not going outside. You see the difference. When I set a limit, I offer a choice. When I give an ultimatum, it's a threat with no choice given. Okay, next slide. What does it mean to set a limit with a child? A limit is a choice with a positive consequence for the positive choice. Now setting limits is a positive thing, okay? It is a positive thing. You're rewarding a positive choice, thereby over time encouraging the positive choice 
and changing decision making, teaching good decision making. Okay, next slide. What is a logical consequence? A logical consequence is a consequence directly related to the, to the severity of the behavior. If I need to set a negative consequence, it needs to be on par with the level of behavior. So I'm not gonna ground a kid for three months for having a dirty room, okay? The best consequence is the fixing of the behavior. A dirty room is behavior, okay? That's a choice to not clean the room. What's the best consequence for that? Clean it up. And once it's clean, here comes your positive consequence, okay? Next slide, please. Okay. Why do we as parents go back to punishment instead of setting limits or using logical consequences? A, punishment is easier. B, when angry, frightened, or hurt, it is our first reaction. C, punishment works in the short term, or D, all of the above. And I hope everybody can see that the answer is D. Okay, it is D. Next slide. On a scale of one to 10, and again, Another little self-evaluation. Rate yourself now. Give yourself a number now. And then when we're done talking, give yourself another number. And then score yourself on a regular basis. Friday night as you're laying in bed, yeah, you know, I think I was, I think it was an eight this month, this this week. And just constantly reevaluate yourself. Okay. Constantly reevaluate yourself. Next slide, please. Now, we're gonna talk about some of, the, some of the solutions, some of the answers to some of the challenges that we talked about at the beginning. So structure the day. Uh, do the same thing, same time each day. Kids wake up, they log on, they're on for a certain amount of time. Do the same time each day. Same workstation each day. Build that structure. Build that structure within a day in the home and then have positive rewards for each day of work. Okay, So it's going to take some monitoring instead of just setting the kids up. Okay. And then make agreements for those rewards. Come to an agreement for work completion. Come to an agreement for logging on. Okay, next slide, please. Now, what does setting limits mean? Setting limits is the result of realizing that we can't force children to display positive behavior. When we set limits, we offer the child a choice starting with the positive choice first and the positive consequence that will follow. Setting limits teaches good decision-making when it's done on a consistent basis. So what does it sound like? If then, if you do this positive thing, then this positive thing will occur to you. Then this positive thing, then you will get this positive thing, okay? I've been doing this with my kids since they, since they could understand what I was saying and they understand. They, they, we still have our challenges in the house. We still have our challenges, but I can count on one hand the amount of times I've had to raise my voice at my kid because they're waiting for that positive. And their decision-making is, is I will pat myself on the back of their decision-making is pretty good, okay? But it's taken years and years and years, okay? Next slide, please. Now, stay away from the trigger words. No, don't stop and quit. No running, don't run, stop running, quit running. As opposed to saying, Michael, I need you to walk through the house. Okay. No yelling, don't yell, stop yelling, quit yelling. Michael, I need you to use your inside voice. It just creates a positive 
environment in the home. And it increases compliance. It absolutely increases compliance. Next slide, please. Use logic when setting limits. Take time to cool off before deciding on a consequence. Send them away, send them upstairs, send them to their room. Think about the consequence. If you feel like you need to use a negative consequence, think about it. Don't say it when you're still hot. And then consistency, enforce consequences, even when it's inconvenient. The best, uh, the best, the best example of that is at the grocery store. Where do they put the candy and everything? Right by the checkout counter. You get there, and then and your child is, "Mom, can I please? Mom, can I please? Mom, can I please?" Okay, here, just be quiet. That's a bad idea. Excuse me, uh, Mr. Checkout, Mr. Um, cash Register. I'm going to take this basket, put it over here. We're leaving. You might have to do that once. Okay. Next, next uh, slide, please. Now, some of the benefits of, let's get back to this distance learning. Some of the benefits are flexible schedules. It's a less stressful learning environment, okay? And it's a, the less, less stressful learning environment is a conducive learning environment. And there's time-saving routines. We're gonna explain each one of those. Next slide, please. Classrooms sometimes can limit creativity. The flexible schedule offers much needed freedom, okay? Gives more space and time for students and it spikes creativity and memory. Flexible, flexible schedules, okay? Next slide, please. It's a less stressful learning environment. Students study at their own pace and therefore they will have an improved attitude toward learning, okay? Next slide. A conducive learning environment. It's a favorable learning environment and they have the freedom to choose resources. They can go to the encyclopedias, they can go to a different website, they can do this, they can do that, they can go to a magazine. Their freedom to choose their resources and they're happy and in good mental health. When we structure, when we structure and then um, add some flexibility to that structure. Okay. The next slide, please. Now, time-saving routine. It focuses on the learner and delivers knowledge in a short time. Okay. Parents can audit the quality of the skills. You can look and see the handwriting. You can look and see the classwork. And then teachers deliver knowledge precisely. Okay. The next slide, please. All right. Expectations. We need to be realistic about our expectations. And what I'm trying to think about, just to kind of wrap everything up, be realistic about your expectations. What are we really trying to ask yourself? What are we really trying to do as parents? And can we force our children to think or behave in a certain way? What we want to do as parents, we want to produce independent thinkers who make good decisions. Okay. All right, next slide, please. All right. Thank you very much. Um, thank you very much, Dr. Simon, for helping me out. <laughs> All right, thank you very much, everyone. So Thank I'm you, a, Mike. And I know uh, uh, that usually, I'm sorry. Oh, no, no, go ahead. I was just going to okay. say I'm very glitchy, so I was going to pass it on to Sam. But go on, Dr. Simon. So we finished for Sam, uh, just starts and also concludes the meeting. I just want to say that I know Mike Anderson usually conducts such behavior workshops uh, in person. Um, he used to conduct those workshops at Tucker, usually a six-week session. 
um, with up to 150 parents in the Tucker Auditorium. And I can say I've, I've had the pleasure of being a part of those presentations. And I can tell you just based on the listening part and how to listen to your kids. Um, I can say for me personally, I have a seven-year-old daughter and 15-year-old son, a teenager. And he's right. Some of the stuff he just walked past here a few minutes ago that he wants to talk about. I'm just like, for real? <laughs> your mother's tired. You want to talk to me about the NBA 2K or right, uh, another game, uh, Fortnite, and you know what just happened, how his partner didn't do things correctly within the video game and they lost. Um, but again, these are interesting times that we're facing with our kids. And I agree, we have to find positive, positivity in something um, and also agree and champion our kids with something, especially right now, just because um, COVID has taken a lot of their peer interactions away, right? So they're grieving and not just grieving because they've lost loved ones, but just because they've lost that routine of doing things a certain way. So um, thank you, uh, Mike Anderson. And I know that some of you guys might feel like, oh my God, that was a lot. You know, I wish we can, you know, really tease that out and go deeper. And um, I know that he's working on potentially maybe having something via Zoom. That's a series, but it's just a little bit more difficult to do that, especially because his presentations are very hands-on with parents. So again, thank you. Mike for really um, working to provide that for us in the Zoom format. In a very condensed time, um, we appreciate your efforts. Samantha? You're welcome. Yes, um, I just wanna let you know, I put the links in the chat here. They're also in the emails that went out to all CAC um, participants about, we'd like feedback for the meeting. If you will fill that out, that would be great. If anyone who has not um, filled out the attendance, that would also be wonderful. Please take a moment and do that. And if there's any questions, um, I don't see any hands raised on um, electronically here. So, and I don't believe there's any questions in the chat at the moment, but we have a little bit of a few moments for questions and any shout outs or good news if anyone has anything they'd like to add at this time. I just want to say that I'm really happy um, I was part of this group, not just presenting to parents, but um, I think the overlap was really nice and necessary. And then we all had different things uh, that we contributed to. And I think it's just so relevant to address this, not just academically and talking about IEPs and the bills and, uh, you know, uh, listening, which is very important. But I think the mental health part is all of us coming together and trying to come up with a plan, whether it's an emergency plan or just closing ourselves in a room and taking this as our alone time too, because that could be a tattoo for some of us. Um, so I think it's 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 really good for this time to you know finish December strong and try to come up with a plan for January, whatever that means for all of us. Um, but really taking care of ourselves, you know, the mental health, the attention piece, the take a bath, you know, go for a walk, whatever that's needed. And also in terms of what Mr. Anderson was saying, listening is very important. Um, but sometimes, you know, things get to us, right? Things get to us. It gets to the kids. And um, the only other piece I wanted to say is a lot of kids, like you were mentioning, um, don't have the resources. I mean, there are a lot of kids who are at McDonald's, you know, logging in and doing whatever they need to do. But there are kids who are doing a lot better at home with virtual learning. So we need to acknowledge and be able to address concerns for both sides of that fence. And I think the only way we can do it is we have people and speakers coming together and willing to, to collaborate, whether it's just Long Beach or countywide, it doesn't really matter. So thank you. Thank okay. Um, appreciate you. Thank you. Thank you. Hi. Thank you, Dr. Powell. Hi. 
Hey. <laughs> oh, how are you? Um, I wanted to um, give, this is Courtney, I wanted to give, um, I'm going to put some information in the chat for you guys. Um, Nubia had some info to pass along, but she had to leave the meeting early. So there is going to be some... There's going to be an, a couple IEP workshops coming up with um, Long Beach Forward. Um, I'm going to put her email address in the chat to RSVP with the dates, January 12th and 14th. And I believe you could go look on their page as well for more information. And we posted it on our Facebook page as well. So just wanted to let you know that you could look in the chat. For Thank you, Courtney. Anyone else? Okay, thank you everyone for, for coming and hope you have a great um, holiday. Take care. Take care, everybody. Thank you, Stay everyone. Safe. Good night. Stay safe.